Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. This is our seventh Rural Resilience webinar um, for the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. And we're just thrilled to have such a great group joining us here tonight. My name is Laura Nelson. I'm Rancher Stewardship Alliance's project leader. And before we get started, I know we have a lot of familiar faces in the room, but um, some of you might not be familiar with Rancher Stewardship Alliance. So before I hand it over to Shaylee, I wanna just share a little bit more about who we are and what we do. So Rancher Stewardship Alliance is a rancher-led nonprofit organization that's based in Malta, Montana. We've been around since about 2003 when a group of South Phillips County ranchers got together um, in a year similar to this one and in the face of a pretty severe drought and just said, hey, we've got to work together um, to build more resilient ranch, a more resilient ranching community and a more resilient um, ranch economy in our area. And so what can we do to, to make our ranches and our families and our community and this landscape more resilient? Um, and that was kind of the start of Rancher Stewardship Alliance. Our mission statement today is ranching, conservation and communities, a winning team. Rancher Stewardship Alliance exists to help multi-generational and beginning ranchers build the collaborative, trusting relationships and community-based solutions that we need to create healthy working landscapes and vibrant rural communities. Now that looks, um, that happens in a lot of different ways, but one of those ways is through education. So our education and workshop committee is really focused on bringing our ranch families the tools and the education and the ideas that we need to, again, build stronger, more resilient uh, ranches and rural communities. So we are thrilled to have you all here with us tonight. Um, a couple of housekeeping things as we have a few more people join in. Um, I just wanna ask that we all remain muted throughout the presentation. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we want you to not be engaged in the presentation. We do ask that you use the chat box. In fact, a lot of folks are continuing to um, use that right now. So please introduce yourself, say hello, let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, I told some of the folks before we started, this is our seventh Rural Resilience webinar. We've had over 900 people register between all seven of those events, representing 26 different states and several um, Canadian provinces. So we love hearing from you and hearing where you're from. So use the chat box. You can use that throughout Shaylee's presentation to type in questions or comments. Um, and I'll keep track of that and bring those to Shaylee in the moderated Q&A at the end of the program. So again, use that chat box throughout the evening um, and we'll be watching that and bring that over to Shaylee when it's the Q&A time. I do also wanna remind you that this will be an interactive event. So Shaylee's gonna present for um, I think about 15 minutes or so and then we'll pause and go into breakout rooms because you know we know that um, ranchers and land stewards, we often learn best when we're learning from each other, right? So we want to make sure that we have time in those small group breakout rooms where a handful of you guys in the audience can just get together and say, hey, what's that look like on your place? Or what's going on here? Or how have you dealt with that situation? And so there will be a time where we throw you guys into breakout rooms for 10 minutes and you have some just kind of peer-to-peer -peer discussion time. So please be prepared for that. Then we'll come back together Shaylee will finish her presentation and we'll go into the Q&A after that. So our final note is that, um, you know, we are able to um, share these rural resilience webinars for free and take care of that through a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And we're super grateful for that. So we just wanna recognize them as a supporter of Rancher Stewardship Alliance's work. And just let you know that if you appreciate and enjoy this educational content um, that RSA sure appreciates any donations that you send our way. We're a nonprofit organization and we wanna to continue to offer this kind of educational programming at a really low and affordable cost in the future. So with that, I will introduce Shaylee Stewart and send it over to her. So a little bit about Shaylee. Shaylee Stewart grew up on a cow calf and haying operation in South Central Montana, where her passion for the livestock industry seeded its roots. Upon graduation, her passion for the beef industry led her to Colorado State University and ultimately to an internship with the United States Cattlemen's Association. Her experiencing following markets for USCA were the springboard for her self-produced cattle market news Facebook page, 
where now more than 18,000 followers seek her market updates. Those weekly reports are a reliable source of easy to understand digestible market information that bring a true boots on the ground perspective to the livestock markets that are growing increasingly difficult to navigate. While her background is in the ranching West, Shaley comes with a solid list of market contacts from around the country. Talking each week to sale barn owners, feedlot managers, and other industry experts, she is able to ask the questions that cattlemen need answered in order to find clarity in a complex and dynamic market. In the fall of 2019, she became the livestock market analyst for DTN, where she provides daily commentary on the live cattle, feeder cattle, and lean hog markets. Shay Lee and her husband Jimmy run a registered herd of Simangus cows near Cody, Wyoming, and they host the annual Big Country Genetics Bull Sale. So we are just thrilled to have Shay Lee with us today. And I'll just share a little more background information. As our education committee came together this fall and we said, man, it's been a tough summer in North Central Montana and across the West with drought conditions. And um, one of Rancher Stewardship Alliance's core values is just to have a positive mindset. And we started to ask, man, it's been a tough year for so many ranchers. What can we do to look ahead to say, hey, you know, how are we going to get through this and look ahead to better days? And that's where we um, wanted to bring Shay Lee in and just ask her to, to give us a little glimpse at the future to say, hey, what, what do we have to look forward to? And what might be we, we be thinking about today as we face some really hard decisions out there in cattle country? Um, that uh, will give us a little bit of hope um, as we look to rebuild or restock after we come out on the other side of this drop. So with that, I will hand it over to Shay Lee. Thanks for being with us tonight. Well, thank you, Laura. I sure appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all tonight. And I, I just want to open the conversation up really and say thank you for diving in. Thank you for tuning into this webinar. Thank you for uh, RSA's opportunity to be here with you tonight. And I couldn't think of a better time to talk about the markets than today in and of itself. Today, the feeder cattle market saw $3 gains throughout the board. Fat cattle have ended up trading $7 higher throughout the last two weeks. And so, you know what? Let's dive into these markets. Let's get excited. Let's be aggressive. Let's take the reins back of this complex and ever-changing marketplace that sometimes we like to step back away from instead of diving into. So with that, I've prepared a presentation for you. I, I'm very excited to see in the chat box kind of where y'all are from because it, it really gives me an opportunity to kind of talk about specific markets and so I'm glad that I focused on the west because that's where it seems like a lot of you are from and so nevertheless we're going to dive into my presentation here and just a couple of seconds and we're going to talk about restocking your cow herd after a drought and so we're going to just walk through these slides we're going to like Laura said go into a breakout session and then we're going to come back so I eagerly ask you that even though we are on zoom that you participate in lively conversation please share any uh questions that you have and if I don't have the answers I promise you I will seek somebody or I will find the information later. After this presentation, take your contact information and get you the answers that you have to your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and that'll give you the presentation. And it might take me just a couple of seconds for um, us to figure out the, the details of getting the screen right, but just give me a couple of seconds and we'll go ahead and dive on into this presentation because I know that time is of the essence. So here we go. All right, is that successful on everybody else's end? Awesome. Okay, well, I don't really need to introduce myself. Laura did a beautiful job of doing that. So thank you, Laura. We're just going to dive on into this presentation as, uh, as we need to do. So I just want you to understand that as I come to you this evening, that I am standing in the same shoes that you all are. And one thing that I've noticed through becoming a livestock market analyst is that nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. And so as you look at these pictures, I kind of pick these just to describe myself and you'll see my family here on the left. They're my pride and joy. And I'm just, I thank God every day for Jimmy and our new son Stetson because there's nothing sweeter than family. And, and why do we do what we do if we can't share it with the loved ones that we have? But then as you look at the other two pictures, I want you to know that I've got skin in the game and that I'm not an analyst sitting behind a computer who, who absorbs a cushy salary and doesn't have any, any skin to lose in this market because 
you know what, that, that just wouldn't be fair to you to, to preach at you. And so I want you to know that as we talk about these hard decisions that you really need to take to, to either your husband or your wife, or maybe it's your, your core group of producers that you work with, we're having those same conversations. And so let's have them together. Let's dive into the fine details and let's talk about restocking after a drought. So I want you to go ahead and take a look at this picture here. And I know that you might be kind of wondering why we have a, a, a brick and mortar building on fire, but I've come to realize that with ranchers, we typically have to step back from our situation and look at someone else's scenario in order to fully understand and to ask objective questions. So I want to I want to walk you through a little story here. Here we have a fire and you see men down there on the bottom of the screen standing on those on those railroad ties shooting a meaningless mist of water onto a building that is that is gone. There's no chance in saving it. You can see that from from the picture here itself. But as you look at that building, that was obviously a factory. That was somebody's that was somebody's profit that they were that they were hoping to capture tomorrow. That was somebody's business that was their livelihood. And so often we as cattlemen find ourselves in similar situations. We feel like the guy standing on, on the railroad ties at the bottom of the screen and like we're just shooting a meaningless mist into a problem that we don't necessarily know how to fix. But before we can advise this gentleman who owns the factory what to do, we need to step back and ask, where does the market need? Where does the market sit today? And what is its long-term trajectory? And my friends, that's where we find ourselves today. Before we can do anything, we have to answer those exact questions. What does the market need? Where does the market sit today in its current kettle cycle? And what is its long-term trajectory? We have to answer those questions before we can worry about restocking, before we can re worry about rebuilding a cow herd. Because until we understand or until we know what the market needs, we can't present a product and we can't be um, successful and we can't be profitable. So let's dive into some more specifics. Okay. All right. I I want to start to go ahead and crack the code with you guys because I know that even though we understand that we need to understand the cattle market, the cattle cycle, it does take a bit of a code to crack in regards to finding the answers. So I want to talk to you about our cow herd in the United States and what's been happening here as of late. On the January 2021 beef cow inventory report, which is shared biannually, but realistically, the market really only absorbs that report that comes out in January. It doesn't really pay much attention to the one that comes out in July. The U.S. cow herd was down, folks, and it totaled, beef cows totaled only 31.2 million head, which was down 1% from 2020. Here in the next couple of months, you and I both know that we will be seeing a new report and that that number will be down significantly. Now, I'm not one that really likes to stick my neck out on the line and say down by how much, but you and I both know that it will be down significantly. And so that's going to have ramifications in the upcoming months and the upcoming years to our cattle cycle. And through this presentation, you're going to see me compare this, this current market a lot to that of 2013 or 2012 and 2013. And I don't have to remind you because you remember so sweetly what came after that. So we need to ask ourselves, as we note these numbers of a shrinking cow herd down 1% from a year ago to 31.2 million head, where are these cows going? Well, it's funny that you ask, and I think that this present, that this graph here shows a great de depiction of what exactly is going on throughout the United States. We know that some ranchers have opted to put their cows in feedlots in the Midwest and are trying to combat this strategy of drought through that option. But the evidence is clear, my friends, that cows and heifers are finding their way into our slaughter production chains, and it is staggering at the rates at which they are entering. As you'll note from this graph presented by Brett Crosby, beef cow slaughter is the third highest level in which it's been in the last 20 years, and heifer slaughter is the fourth highest it's been in the last 15 years. Now, when you think about it, let's not, let's not overlook those percentages and the long-term trajectory of what that means when beef cow slaughter is the third highest it's been in the last 20 years and heifer slaughter is the fourth highest it's been in the last 15 years. We can't overlook that because when we talk about these cows, these cows that are anticipated to go into working in, in herds such as yours, 
we have to wonder how that's going to affect the beef industry later down the road. And so what does that mean? That means fewer cows are going to produce fewer calves to market. Fewer, they're going to be, there are going to be fewer calf prospects for feedlots to feed. And eventually that means that there's going to be fewer fat cattle lining the bunks throughout the Midwest for packers to hopefully compete over. But nevertheless, competition and fewer cattle will drive prices higher. But you might be asking yourselves, we're talking a lot about the markets and we're not talking much about restocking. And, and that might seem as a, as a surprise to you because that's what this presentation was supposed to be. But I promise you, friends, that if your goal is to restock and achieve profitability, then you cannot do so without understanding where the market sits today, as you'll have to change your game in order to get back into the market tomorrow. So now that we've established that there will be significantly fewer cows in the, in the months and weeks and years ahead, and that there are going and that prices are going to be substantially higher, let's begin to plan. Now, I think it's only important that we first establish some basics. I need you to know that what would work for one producer might not work for another. And each operation is going to have different, different um, resources to, to ping upon, different bankers that they use and, and how they work together and the options that they're given. And what the biggest point though that we need to understand is what, what, what one option may be for today's drought might not be an option for tomorrow's drought, as again, it all depends where we are at in the current cattle cycle. So let's go ahead and hit the drawing board of today's current cycle and what options might you have. I think we first need to take a little walk down memory lane to jog your memory. Here I have ba the basic understandings of what happened back in 2012 through 2016. And so I just want to take a minute to really talk about the feeder cattle market as that's how most of you sell your cattle and uh, sell your calves, excuse me, and, and how you reap profits. And so here on the left-hand side of the graph that's shared in front of you, you're going to see the 2012 feeder cattle market. You'll see it bounce higher, it bounced lower. The red line depicts where it found uh, the lowest point in the market. The green line at $1.61 is where it found the highest point in the market. But as you look further across the right to the 2014 top, which is the very top green line on this, track, on this graph, that's where the price is headed in a matter of only two short years. And if you remember right, 2012 was a severe drought. And so we need to really understand what, what ramifications and what we can learn from history as this market was something that honestly, we hope to all see again someday. But what I need you to remember is that from 2012 to 2014, there was only a mere two years that eclipsed in time. And as you, as you know, as we're talking about restocking our cow herds, the 2014 rally in the feeder cattle market didn't wait for producers to restock their cow herds. It happened. The producers that were able to, able to capture the profits took the profits. And those that hadn't stocked their cow herds or didn't have as many calves to market, unfortunately, didn't capture those gains that the market offered for a mere short time before scaling lower to the prices that we see today. So now that we understand and have taken a little, a little example, I want you to think about how maybe this, this, this walk down memory lane reflects today's market and what we might need to have conversations about moving forward. Let's go ahead and talk about destocking. And I know that understanding where your operation, and I know, and I know that most of you understand that knowing where your operation makes money is crucial, but it is especially important when you think about destocking. And so when we talk about destocking, and if you ever plan to re-enter the market, we must keep a long-term perspective because the ec economic impact of drought destocking typically affects ranches for the next seven to 10 years. And so you're thinking, how in the world does it affect ranches for the next seven to 10 years? But extensive studies have proven that, have shown it, and it's because of visible and invisible costs. So let's go ahead and talk about what exactly those costs are and what you might need to be thinking of. So visible costs, those are the easy ones to talk about. They're the obvious costs. So when you destock and you think about visible costs, 
you would be you would be thinking about you know what i just sold some cows and i know that since i want to get back into the market at some point i'm going to have to replace those females that my friends that is a visible cost that's easy we know that assumption but often it's the invisible costs that end up outweighing the visible costs and that and that they are what make a good decision what seems like a decision a good decision actually a costly painful decision in the end that actually shouldn't have been a decision made at all it was a poor decision and those are called invisible costs so as we think about destocking we really need to hone in on these invisible costs and understand what they are and understand how they could cost us profitability in the current cattle cycle and then one easy example of what an invisible cost is is not having calves to market in the in the upcoming years when the cattle market makes its peak. So just like we talked about in 2012 when people had to destock and they sold cows that lessened their factory, quote unquote, their cow herd, they had fewer calves to market in 2014 because a lot of those folks, a lot of those individuals had restocked by that point. And honestly, that's essentially what I'm worried about happening as we move forward in this current cattle market, current cattle cycle. I don't want producers to get caught in the trap is of when this cattle market, this cattle cycle makes it peak, makes its peak, not having enough calves to market and to really hone in and capture the profitability that's that's offered just for a mere minute in the market. And so you might be wondering, well, Shaylee, I understand that that's a great that's a great perspective and that's a great opinion, but have you really put the numbers to the test? And 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 you know what? How, how do you know this? And so in researching drought and in researching the cattle market, I was actually able to find that my friend Harlan Hughes did a study on this exact matter back in 2012 when drought affected much of the West like it is now. He worked with a rancher who had 250 head of mature cows and who had historically kept his replacement females to add youth and longevity to his cow herd. Upon evaluating the situation, his money on hand, the hay that he had produced, and the current price of hay, which was $225 a ton to $300 a ton, he decided that he needed to sell 50 cows and keep no replacement heifers in order to survive this drought. Now, naturally, fewer cows implies fewer calves to sell, but that wasn't taken into account when, uh, excuse me, that wasn't taken into account when uh, he did his culling back in 2012. He only saw those ramifications in 2014. Now, this graph shows the projected annual numbers of cows sold for each of the 10 years in the study. Since no female placements were held back in 2012, the number of calves spiked in 2012 and added extra income, added extra revenue to his operation. And with the 50 mature cows sold in 2012, the, the number of calves the producer was able to market in 2013 fell and it fell again in 2014. So I, I know that these are dated, these are dated graphs, but I want you to look at what happened to this producer. Go ahead and look at the column as 2011. That is the year that the drought started. It carried over into 2012, and that's when the producer who had 250 mama cows said, you know what, I gotta do something different. So he marketed 50 cows, he marketed all of his replacement females, and that shot his cash flow up significantly. But then when you look at the, the, the right-hand portion of this graph, you'll see that in 2013 and in 2014, when the market was excellent, he had fewer caps to sell because of it. And that cost him, actually. So we need to understand how destocking changes our cash flow. And it affects our cash flow significantly. As you can see, in 2012, when the said producer marketed his normal set of cows plus his 50 coal cows, and his replacement uh, heifers, his, his income skyrocketed. But the invisible cost of this situation lies in the income of 2013 and 2014. Look at how low the, his income is in 2013 because he had to market those cows for drought. Now, I'm not saying that this gentleman did anything wrong because as you guys know, some of you are in tougher situations than others, but essentially, when you are put to the test, you need to run all options through your mind. Could you put cows on trucks and send them to Nebraska and put them on feed? Could you pick up another lease from a neighbor who maybe decided to get out of business altogether? Because when you look at what happened to this gentleman, let's just say in 2011 through 2015, the, the, the amount of money that, that 
went through his cash flow and how it how it changed his trajectory is substantial. And I, I think it's really important to share that what Harlan Hughes found in his conclusion. And he said, the largest negative cash flow impact of drought destocking in the year is of that following the drought. So if we're in a drought right now, we're in 2021, he says that the biggest hit that you'll find in your cash flow is next year. And one has to wonder how much hay could have one bought, how much hay could could have this producer in this graph bought in order to keep his calves and, and cows and have more calves to sell in 2013 and 2014. And I know that that might be, that might seem a little harsh, that might seem a little cruel because how in the world does one afford hay prices that range anywhere from $200 a ton to $300 a ton? But it's something that we need to ask ourselves as just one option in the grand scheme of things because we know what happened in 2013 and 2014 to calf prices. And because we've had seen such a reduction in the United States cow herd, we have to ask ourselves, is that what the market's gonna see in 2022, 2023, and maybe even 2024? So now this gives you guys an opportunity to ask yourself some of those exact questions. This is the breakout session that Laura mentioned earlier. And so I just wanna pose this question to you. Have you had to destock due to drought conditions or are you planning to do so? And if you have had to destock, what invisible costs might you face moving forward? And how do you plan to capitalize on the current cattle market's current cycle in order to generate positive cash flow if you have destocked? So I'm gonna just go ahead and mute my mic, let you guys uh, head into your breakout sessions, and then we will move forward. Awesome. Yep. I'll go ahead and jump on in here. I might have been a little long winded in that first half. So we'll try to keep it short and sweet and to the point and just kind of hash out some of the options that you might need to think about moving forward. And so I know that we talked a lot about, you know, protecting profits and knowing where we're at in the current cattle cycle. And now let's go ahead and, and address the question that you've been dying to hear, hear about. And so let's go ahead and talk about some restocking options. And we're just honestly going to shoot these, these options from the hip. And we're going to talk about pros of this, of this option, cons of this option. And we're just going to hopefully fuel ideas for your operation. And maybe think about some things that you haven't thought of yet. So let's go ahead and dive into these options. Um, I, I mistitled this. We're actually going to talk about five options, not four. So getting into the first one, we are going to talk about restocking with heifer calves. I don't know if many of you have uh, ran that idea across your kitchen table yet, but in case some of you have, let's go ahead and line out some of the fine details. And so as you can see, pros and cons, pros are obviously they're going to be less expensive to get into, and you're going to have less pounds per acre exposed when you talk, think about your operation as a whole. And so we have to respect our ground. We have to respect the land. We have to respect that, you know, what, we're in a drought situation here. So we can't just go get, a, you know, an, a new pot load of cows and say, let's just go ahead and buy cows. Who cares about the drought? We just want to make sure that we're able to capitalize on the market when it gets stronger. And so we do need to take into consideration the less pounds per acre. And so let's just go ahead and break down an example of what exactly that means if you were to think about purchasing heifer calves. So if your ranch typically runs 100 cows weighing 1,300 pounds and your calves midsummer are weighing about 300 pounds, then restocking with 100 heifer calves weighing 800 pounds per midsummer will allow your ranch to continue to heal from the drought as you will be running half as many pounds per acre. So I really think that it's important that we highlight that, that bullet point pounds per acre because you might kind of be caught up in the mindset of, well, you know what, I've got, I've got live animals out on pasture, so am I really letting my ground rest? Am I letting it heal? And the, op and the answer is yes, because it's a difference in pounds per acre. So now let's go ahead and talk about some other pros to buying heifer calves. You can either keep them or you can turn and burn them. You know, we've talked about this fat cattle market, and I told you earlier today that this week alone, the fat cattle market saw an advancement of $3 today and 2 to $4 last week. And we've, we've uh, read and we've seen from recent cattle on feed reports that there are fewer calves in the feedlots. And so with beef demand as heightened as it is right now, you have options if you buy heifer calves. You can either keep them as replacements, you can sell them as breads, or you can go ahead and market them as, as fat cattle later down the road. Cons, if you're planning on keeping these heifer calves until the age of calving, it's a long, long wait until you get a return. And realistically, if you bought heifer calves this fall, 
and you kept them to calving age, you really miss out on a lot of opportunities from then to now because that's such an expanded period of time. Let's go ahead and talk about restocking options with yearling steers. Pros and cons again. Again, you'd have fewer cattle on feed and higher fat cattle prices equal higher profits. So yearling steers, you obviously don't have the advantage of keeping them until later in their lifespan and running them as replacement quality animals. Obviously they're steers, but again, you get that advantage, you get that boost, you get that advantage of less pounds per acre. You're letting your ground heal while continuing to run cattle on it. And you're able to capitalize on the fact that yearling steers, you know what, you could buy them maybe this fall, maybe early next spring, go ahead and market them in the fall. And then you're gonna have some cash. You're gonna be sitting on a lump sum of money. and You might be able to invest that into cows later. When you think about yearling, though, I know so many of you wonder if you have the necessary labor. You know what, you're going to get some sickness, you're going to get some pesky buggers that like to go ahead and push up against the fence. Are you going to be able to keep them where they need to belong? And if you desire a con to buy in yearlings, steers would be again, you're on the hunt as soon as you sell them for working cows again, working age cows that continue to go back and rebuild that factory. So kind of weighing out the pros and cons. And, and like I said, right now, we're just kind of shooting ideas from the hip of, of buying this group, buying the next group and what that might entail. So feel free to, to drop down questions and we'll, we'll pick that up in a second. The next option would to be buying bred heifers. And this one is one that I think typically stings a lot of people because they have good intentions. They have a good mindset and they've got, they've got good intentions in their, in their business plans. So the pros with bu buying heifers would be you're rebuilding with a strong, young cow base that'll offer a lot of longevity. But I caution you, and I'm not saying that one option fits all of us because it certainly doesn't, but whenever the cattle market starts to peak higher, starts to get into those higher calf prices, everybody wants to be a cowman. Everybody wants to own a group of cows. Everybody wants to be able to say that they own cows and they're going to be able to capitalize on these stronger feeder cattle prices and that shoots bred heifers higher. And that so that means that there's going to be a lot of competition for those females. One thing that I'll caution you about is obviously with bred heifers, you run the risk of a higher fallout ratio. Some of them aren't going to breed back. Some of them aren't going to raise a calf. Some of them aren't going to wean off a calf that you desire. And usually, like I in the bullet point, they're the, they're the uh, apple of the market size, so they're higher, higher price. And the calf crop usually isn't as consistent. Moving next on to restocking with young cows. This one is probably my pick of the five that we've talked about. When it comes to restocking, you know what? There's obviously advantages to each group of the of the cattle market, the cattle sector that you could that you could reason or that you could understand. And it, like again, like I said, it really depends on the resources you have and what you're able to do on your own unique operation. And that's going to vary from person to person, ranch to ranch. But I think that just buying a good set of good young cows has a lot of merit because you know what? They're going to offer you a set of uniform calves and they're not typically going to be as expensive as bred heifers, but the competition to get into these cows because we've seen such liquidation here in the West, it could be costly. So one thing that we haven't talked about in this presentation is maybe you need to look not in your, your neighborhood for buying or selling. Maybe you need to put wheels on these cattle. Maybe you need to look at, you know what, if you're sitting in Montana, are there some, are there some females for sale in Nebraska that you might be able to pick up? Are there some females for sale in Missouri that you're able to pick up? You know what, I know that environment always plays a factor in purchasing cows, but you know what, if you can get them at the right price, then you can justify having some fallout. One of my one of the favorite things that my grandpa says is he always says you make the money you make your money the day you buy not the day you sell and so when you're looking at restocking I hope that you really kind of cherish those words you make your money the day you buy not the day you sell because if you buy a good group of cows and you know what they're going to honor your ranch they're going to help you attain your goals they're going to help you seek profitability then you know what they were worth every penny. Adversely, if you buy a group of cows that's just pretty sorry and they don't offer you what you needed in order to make ends meet, your, you know, your, your cash flow budget sinks lower and consequently it was a bad decision, that's going to cost you more than what it would have just to simply wait and find a good group of cows. And restocking, lastly, this is our last option in restocking. What if you were to buy some short-term cows? 
I'm never going to knock on the short term cow because I think it's a good, honest way to make a lot of money in the cattle market. And especially because it's inexpensive on the front end. You know what? Cash flow is hard in this business. And so if you're wanting to dive into a group of cows, I think that it's always a good idea to look at short term cows. But in this current market, we might be careful because you know what? Soon again, you're going to have to restock. You're not building longevity into your cow herd. And with hay prices and drought crippling the West, you're going to have to have good feed in order to run those short-term cows. So be very cautious if that's an option that you're looking to, uh, to, to utilize throughout your operation. And uh, nevertheless, there's pros and cons to everything. So in conclusion, I hope that you understand that when we think about the cattle market, when we think about drought, when we think about years of prosperity, it all comes down to the bottom line that we have to understand where we sit in the current cattle cycle. Secondly, I hope that you understand that there are visible costs and there are invisible expenses of destocking. So I know that stomaching those higher hay prices today might be something that you just cannot do. And you know what? It might grit your teeth to have to pay that freight bill to ship your cows to the Midwest, the corn stocks. But you know what? The invisible expenses of not having calves to market potentially in the years to come when the calf market could be exceptional that's an expense that's gonna hurt you too. So I really advise that you seek advice from your peers and your professionals. And I know you might kind of wonder, well, why are we seeking advice from our peers? That guy down the road, he doesn't know what to do. I talked to him, I talked to him about it this morning having coffee and he's in the same boat that I am. But you know what? Whenever we have a conversation pertaining to cattle, in the cattle market and what we're going to do, it, it starts to it starts to produce thoughts. It starts to help us align our, our trajectory. And you know what? Whenever we can help ourselves or help someone and that's in the same boat, it's a win for the cattle market. So nevertheless, guys, I just want to thank you. I'm going to go ahead and end on this next slide with my contact information. And so I'm here to tell you that if my words sounded good tonight, I got to give all glory to God because I'm just a person with a mouth and with a mind that likes to think about the cattle market. And if it didn't sound good, if it didn't tickle your fancy, then I'll take all that credit instead. So if you have any questions, I sure want to give you my contact information here. Feel free to email me. Feel free to reach out to our ranch at bigcountrygenetics.com. And if you're interested in signing up for weekly market reports, you can find me on Cattle Market News. Just go ahead and search that in your search engine. And if you want to just kind to uh, shoot the market from your hip and just have somebody to talk to, like I mentioned, there's my phone number as well. I, I do have a toddler, so I'm not always the best conversation in the morning, but after a good cup of coffee, I'm not too bad. So nevertheless, we'll go ahead and open it up to some Q&A, and I hope that uh, you guys enjoyed your time tonight. I know that I sure did. All right. Thank you so much, Shaylee. We appreciate you. We appreciate your time and your insight. And we would ask that if you have questions for Shaylee or thoughts that you want to share, um, go ahead and drop those in the comment section. And I don't see any so far, but Shaylee, I'm wondering if you could just go into a little bit more depth on some other unseen costs or invisible costs. So you mentioned the, the loss of profit in the years to come if you don't have cattle that you're able to be selling in a higher market year, but can you detail a few other invisible costs that maybe folks aren't thinking about right now? That's a very good question. I'm glad that you asked because you know what, invisible costs, they often stack up more gr greater than what, what our visible costs are. So when we look at the market today and we look, you know, at the market moving forward, we have to be very careful of these visible, invisible costs because you know what? Inflation is something that we're already stomaching right now. And it's something that's inevitably with our debt that the country sits with right now, something that we're going to have to grapple with in the years moving forward. And I also think that with that comes higher interest rates. So as you're thinking about buying these cows, you know what? I, I know what it's hard to think about buying cows, let's say right here and right now, but talk about an interest rate of, let's say, two and a half percent right now versus an interest rate of, let's just go ahead and be bold. Let's say, you know what, 10 percent in, in the upcoming years or let's say, you know, what my grandparents had to go through, 18 to 20 percent. That's a big deal. And that's an invisible cost that can really jeopardize your opportunity. So along with just having sheer numbers of calves to market, I'd say really pay attention to inflation through hay prices, equipment that you have to buy that, that steals the opportunity of you for your your, your operation to purchase cows and then also interest rates. Okay, thanks Shaylee. Um, Sue asks, where do you recommend getting cattle market data? 
Well, I think that um, th there's a lot of good resources out there. And actually, the USDA, if you know what reports you're after, the USDA is a wealth of information. And I know you might kind of roll your eyes because that's a government agency, but I promise you that is where we harness, that is where we market so much of the data that we get daily. But then also I do have to give DTN a bone here because they've got phenomenal, you know, they've got phenomenal books of just history of market data. And so whether you're looking for a specific thing and you know what, you just want to reach out to me and I can shoot you the USDA link, or you're maybe looking for a, you know, a long-term report that's been generated, I'd reach out to DTN. ETN as well, and maybe think about getting one of those subscriptions. But my friends, the USDA, it's free. It's there for you to use. It just is a big job to, to harness that information and keep up with it. But anything that you could ever think of is really out there. So, and Shaylee, you said, if you know what you're looking for, can you share maybe what are the top one, two, or three reports that are your go-to that are going to give you the most information that, uh, that a rancher needs? Ooh, that's that's a good question, but I will say it it varies. The reports that I that I mine and that I harvest really vary on where we're at in the cattle market and what we're looking at. So one that I think all of you will appreciate is that each Tuesday there is a feeder cattle report of the entire United States that is shared from the USDA and it breaks down what the prices were the previous week and what they were compared to a year ago. And not only does it break out prices, but it also breaks out volumes, the sheer number of cattle that sold. So regardless if you're in Montana or if you're in Missouri, you're going to be able to click on your region and you're going to be able to see what those cattle sold for. And it, kind of, and it typically gives you trends of, you know what, they were $2 higher, $4 lower, and uh, it doesn't necessarily break it out state by state, it's just collectively a lump sum. So I think that that's a really good report for you all to watch. And then I will say the LMCT 154 report, that is the sheer amount of cash cattle that traded each and every week. And so that tells you how aggressive packers are being in the cash cattle market. That tells you what the prices were the previous week. And that gives you a really good indication of what uh, of what beef demand is. Because when packers are, are really mining the cash cattle market, that tells you that they're seeking because there's profits on the table. And that tells you that feedlots are hopefully going to be able to move the market stronger. Mm -hmm. So Shaylee, we've gotten a couple of somewhat similar questions. I'll read them all to you, um, but they all kind of revolve around the idea of, but what do we do if we don't know when the drought will end and we don't know when moisture will return? Let me read these questions so you can kind of get the full scope of their questions. Stephen asks, how do you project the opportunity cost of next year's calf if you don't know if the drought will end soon? Bill says, how do you weigh replacement strategies, not knowing when the moisture may or may not come? And Kim and Carrie say, we're also concerned with continued drought and letting the ranch recover. I think that you all are very wise people. We here are a market, we are an industry that prays for rain because it affects our bottom line. And I wish I could tell you that in my expertise, I knew when the drought was going to end, but obviously that would be a blatant lie. And so I think that what we need to do in this, in this one specific scenario, and your operation is going to be different because um, the resources that you have to work with, with the connections you have, how, you know, lenient your banker is going to be on being patient with you or, you know, what, just, just the sheer spot and where you're at in regards to, you know, stomaching these, these trials is different for every operation. And so what I would say to you is reach out and get creative. And there are opportunities whenever there are trials. And so in this market, you know, we're being tested. We're really being tested. Are we willing to dive into the, the nitty gritty and figure out, is it worth for us to run cows? And I hate even having to, to, to sputter that statement because we're cattlemen, right? It's always worth it. But you know what? We have to look at these not as hobbies, as businesses. And so, you know what? If you're, if you're running the numbers and you're unable to find a way that is profitable for you to run cows out your front door, I really encourage you to, to look at options elsewhere. You know what? We, we uh, didn't want to pay the hay expense of running cows here in Cody this winter. And so we sent some to Nebraska. And you know what, it's not fun to, to know that your cows are hundreds of miles away, but you know what, from a profitability standpoint, that's what we had to do. And while I can't tell you when the drought's gonna end, I'm gonna promise you that somewhere is gonna get rain. I'm gonna promise you that not everywhere in the United States is gonna be in a drought. You know what, we, we sometimes get caught in a really tunnel mindset that everywhere is in a drought. But you know what, those Southern states, they got a tremendous amount of rain this year. We have one friend who wasn't able to put up his hay for the third cutting because he had too much rain. He wasn't simply able to put it up. 
And so, you know what, you might think about, you might think about selling your cows and getting back into some cows later if drought, if drought, if the drought crisis ends. Or you know what, you might think about putting wheels underneath your cows and maybe running them on shares or running them with somebody until the drought ends. But I would really, I, I really encourage you to look beyond the, the, uh, the ramifications of here and now in your front door and say, what other options are there that might make us uncomfortable, but might be what we have to do when this drought is presenting itself. Thanks, Shaylee. Um, one more question in here um, from Kim and Carrie. What do you think of keeping heifer calves bred for 21 days and selling bred young cows? I think that you have a hot commodity. I really do. You know what? I'm as I'm going through these reports daily. It, I, I like to watch going back to USDA's and their reports and everything that they have to offer. Each and every sale barn that is affiliated with the USDA has to report, you know, the calves that sold. And you know what? You might say that they only report the higher end, but typically they give you a trend. And it has been crazy to see the sheer amount of interest that's been in replacement females and just simply heifer calves. So you know what? If you're going to keep those heifer calves and, and maybe run them over until next year, you just want to, like you said, breed them and sell them and turn them as young females. I think that's an excellent, excellent, excellent idea. As you have a, as you have a commodity that so many are going to be after, given the fact that they've had to uh, destock because of drought. So I think that's a great idea. All right, so go ahead and um, let us know if you have more questions. In the meantime, um, I'm going to ask Angel to go ahead and drop the um, post-event survey into the chat box. Um, if you have some additional comments or questions or, or thoughts or ideas, please drop those in the chat box. Otherwise, we'll wrap up here shortly. We do ask that you take, you know, two or three minutes is all it takes to fill out those post-event surveys. And that really does make a difference to us at Rancher Stewardship Alliance to make sure that we're going in the right direction. We always ask for folks to give us feedback on future topics for these rural resilience webinars. We're already lining up and planning for our 2022 lineup right now. So we'd love to um, hear your thoughts and your feedback. It, it really, it does uh, make a big difference to us. So in the meantime, we've got a couple more question, questions. Um, how do you ask uh, for any predictions on calf prices for fall of 2022? Oh, that's a good question, and one that I would only answer if I had a crystal ball in my hand. And I don't think that you ever touch that question because it will come back to burn you. But what I will tell you is that I do believe the calf market will be stronger simply because our factory has been weakened. We don't have as many cows producing calves. I mean, I know that this calf market right now isn't necessarily what you all had hoped for, but it is better than last year. And we and we have fewer cows this year than what we did last year. And so I'm very encouraged for 2022 in the calf market that it might bring. Okay, and a couple more questions. Um, Bill asked, when might the cost of young cows not twos be the lowest this winter? Oh, Bill, that's a tough one. And I don't know that we can really pinpoint that. You know, obviously, if you're looking at uh, young cows and not twos, not, not bred heifers, or, or maybe even those threes, I, I would tell you to watch the market when there wouldn't be someone else sitting in your same shoes watching the market. So I, I don't know if you're a gentleman that likes to go and procure your females through uh, producers around you, or if you like to go to the sale barns, but honestly, the holidays sometimes are a good opportunity for you to get a smoking deal because nobody wants to sit in the sale barn during the holidays because they want to be with their families. And so the week of, of the holidays, typically there's not a lot of receipts and you're able to buy some cows that uh, demand uh, weaker prices. And then after the first of the year, it takes some markets, usually two to three weeks to really heat up and get active and so you might think about uh watching the market right after the first of the year as well as people are kind of getting their taxes figured out sitting where they see and uh, seeing where they sit excuse me and uh, just kind of getting their head perspective for the year ahead so i my biggest piece of advice would be is from someone in your shoes when would you see the least amount of competition for that commodity in which you're after Good thoughts. We have a couple more questions coming in here. Connie asks, what would you consider the highest value animal today? Bread twos and threes, middle, uh, middle age bred cows. What do you think? Uh, can you post that question one more time? 
Yeah. What would you consider the highest value animal today? Well, I think that you have to, again, start at the basics. Where are we at in the current cattle cycle? And then you have to ask yourself, where do you sit in regards to your operation, your ranch? If you're sitting on a tremendous amount of grass, then you know what? Maybe you take a risk and, and you like to spin the idea of, you know what? It doesn't matter if I have to pay more for younger females later down the road. I'm going to buy some heifer calves. I'm going to spin them here in a couple of months when the market gets hot. And then I'm going to jump into some young females. But if you don't have a lot of flexibility, if, if I had all the money in the world right now and I could do something, I would go get into those, those young females. I wouldn't buy bred heifers because, you know what, the fallout's too risky. You don't know if they're going to breed back. But I want cows that are going to be young, going to give me longevity, going to have a lot of working age left in them. I would go and get those young cows that are going to offer you an excellent group of calves to market next fall and, uh, and, and go ahead and run with them. That's what I would do. Okay, Shaylee, this, I think this, this question um, kind of relates back to what Bill was asking earlier, but I'm going to ask it just to see if you have a little bit different take on it. If you're planning on, sure, I understand. If you're planning on buying more cows, would it be better to buy now before this spring when the markets tend to jump? Oh, absolutely. I do believe that. Now, granted, whenever you say something's going to happen in the cattle market, the cattle market has a beautiful way of humbling you and the opposite happens. So, I, I, you know, what? if I was standing in your shoes and if you were interested in buying cows, that's what I would do as well. I would go get into whatever you're going to buy now. And I know that that comes with a lofty feed expense. And I know that that's hard to justify. But you know what? Given where we're at in the cattle cycle, I know I'm beating a dead horse with that cattle cycle, but it's something that we cannot overlook. But where we sit at in the, in the current market with the cattle cycle, there's going to be a lot of competition for any type of red female next spring because nobody wants to feed them through the winter. Nobody wants to go out and put on their snow pants and their muck boots and make sure they have feed and just tend to them and take care of them. Nobody really wants to cow them. And so pears are going to be very expensive next spring is my prediction. I believe that bred females of all sorts are going to be expensive or all of all sorts are going to be expensive next spring. And so I truly do believe that if you're interested in getting in the market more aggressively, you better get it done now or be willing to pay higher prices next spring. All right. Thank you, Shaylee. And we're a little bit past eight o'clock. So we're, we're past our, our hour program time. I think this was a really great conversation. Um, great questions. Great information, Shaylee. We just really appreciate you. We appreciate your time and your insight. Um, we did share, you have Shaylee's contact information there. And um, Angel, if she could drop, if you could drop that um, survey link back into the chat box one more time, just so folks can grab it before they head out. Um, if you have any further questions, you can reach out to Shaylee. Shaylee, if you have any other resources that you want to share, links, information like that, we'll send that out to the group um, afterwards. And otherwise, we just, uh, we appreciate you and um, we appreciate each of you for investing your time and your energy into uh, being a part of this conversation tonight. So with that, we uh, will thank you and say good night.